flying through space in the infinite void, borne on the backs of four elephants who themselves stand atop the shell of the great star turtle Atuin, we find Discworld, a world and mirror of worlds. Hello and welcome to the very first of our videos on the world and lore of Terry Pratchett's famous Discworld series. These are a series of books very near and dear to my heart, both for their excellent storytelling and world building, not to mention their comedy, and this is a world that I hope to be able to explore with you in this video series. So let's begin with an overview of the most important part of Discworld, the disc itself. The disc world is a flat world. Well, not totally flat. It has ocean depths and mountain ranges, same as any other world would have, and is about 10,000 miles across and 30 miles thick at the rim, getting thicker as you move towards the middle, which is referred to as the hub, with the climate becoming colder the more you proceed towards the middle of the disc, with the tropic regions therefore out and near the edge. It is at this hub that you will also find Cori Celesti. Technically a mountain, it is 10 miles high and wrapped in a thick sheet of blue-green ice and marked with grey stone outcrops. At its peak, you will find the home of the gods, Dun Manifesti. The name of choice for this Olympian facsimile should go a long way to telling you the sense of humour of style possessed by the gods of Discworld. Needless to say, this unique geography does not follow what we would consider the traditional directions for north, south, east and west when looking at its maps, but rather thinks in terms of hubwards, towards the centre, rimwards, towards the edge of the disc, turnwise, along the direction of the disc spin, and widdershins, counter-turnwise. Despite being a mobile orbital body, the disc does still have a sun and moon, achieved relatively easily in the case of the moon, simply being a large asteroid in orbit, but the sun itself is a more unusual case, as it is a microstar in a stable and travelling orbit around the world and the turtle itself. Due to the rotation of the disc and the smaller size of the sun, the effect this gives the disc world is a full spin cycle that takes 800 days, where each year contains two of every season and a calendar of eight days in a week, 26 months, which are often seen in portions of 13 referred to as common years marking the end of one of the set of four seasons hopefully we'll be able to go into more depth on this in the future but i wanted to bring it up here to highlight the effects that are brought on by the geography of the disc itself being somewhat different to our own Back on the matter of the Sun itself, many people familiar with the fundamentals of astrophysics might consider the way that it operates to be unlikely, if not downright impossible. But this all comes down to the fact that the universe in which the disk exists is not like ours. As it has been put in the Science of Discworld series of books, ours is a universe that runs on rules and logic. Theirs is a world that runs on magic and narrativium. The enigmatic force known as narrativium is perhaps the core driving principle behind everything in Discworld, an element present in all things but lacking any kind of physical presence in the world itself. It is responsible and part of the core driving phenomenon of narrative causality and stories. The sun orbits the world because it should, because that is the story that people tell themselves. Events will follow common narrative paths if they stray too close to them, like leaves falling into a stream. An oft-given example in the series is that when a quest claims the life of two brothers, it is impossible for the third brother to fail. A million to one chance will always work, no matter how unlikely, because really that's the way the world should work. Following the narrativium that is generated by all living beings who tell stories, and most importantly, believe. Because, according to death in the novel Hogfather, without belief the sun would not even rise. A mere flaming ball of gas would illuminate the sky. Being a world of magic, Discworld is also home to far more than just humans as its sentient species population, being home to over a half dozen species of human level intelligence or higher, as well as intelligent examples of many species found on our Earth, largely in the form of various corvid birds and rodents that live in areas of high magical background potential, as well as a species of tree, the sapient pearwood which is intelligent enough to go for walks and should you make travel accessories out of it, will be able to follow you on their own without actually needing to be carried anywhere. Of the species mentioned to have what could be considered cultures, we have humans, dwarfs, trolls, goblins, gnomes, werewolves, vampires, and not least, feagles. Among species like the trolls, there are also a number of offshoots that include the gargoyles, gnolls, and yetis, which are members of the troll species that have become specialized for various environments and climates. There are also a large number of cryptid species and undead who make up creatures of myth and legend, who on the disc are mostly just trying to get by in life like everyone else, although a few of them, like the wild banshees and dryads of the deep forests, are nothing short of vindictive and murderous. Others, like like the Gorgons of Ephebe, are simply trying to adapt to the modern world, moving into cities and making a concerted effort to make sure that they have very good sunglasses to avoid incidents of accidental petrification. 
As to the geography of the world itself, the disk is split into a number of continents, subcontinents, and island chains. The biggest landmass is the central continent, which pulls Widdishin's rimwards, or about due south in our terms, or directly down, if you're looking at the map that I currently have on screen, down towards the far rim, a continent that, in a single landmass, encompasses most of the inhabited land on the disk. We're going to be spending the rest of this video giving a general overview of the major nations of the disks, but of course we don't have enough time for me to go into detail on every single one. Hopefully if this little project continues we'll be able to give all the places mentioned here their own video where I can talk more about them in depth. So heading away from the hub in order we have the Ramtops and the Kingdom of Lankra, the largest of a number of small micro kingdoms found in the mountains. And when you consider that Lankra itself is a mere 400 square miles, meaning that it measures somewhat smaller than the city of London by a whole 200 square miles, it just it speaks volumes for how little flat land is available in the Ramtops. Perhaps due to this the Ramtops are also home to a large number of the dwarven mining cities, each ruled over by its own king, the largest and most recognised in the area being one called Copperhead. Although in addition to these more traditional settlements, there are among the mountain peaks a large number of monasteries for just about every form of enlightenment that one could imagine, including the rather important Order of Wen, the Brotherhood of the History Monks of Time. Moving on from here, we have three possible directions to take. Towards the Rim Ocean lies the Octarine Grass Country, the Chalklands and the rain-soaked nation of Lamidos, a land we know little of save for its love of druids, stone circles and having so much rain that rainwater has somehow managed to become the major export. In the opposite direction lies a section of the world we know so much more about, Uberwald. Uberwald is a large expanse of land broken up into petty kingdoms, baronies, duchies, dwarven kingdoms, city-states and nations, with borders that shift every year due to endless internal wars over matters lost to time. Of these warring nations, Borogravia and Slovenia are perhaps the most well-known. The rest of Uberwald, as mentioned, is mostly city-states and small feudal states, variously ruled by vampire or werewolf bloodlines and the occasional human noble. In recent times, however, the smaller states that make up Greater Uberwald have been brought together into a unified confederation so that they might be better unified in the face of world politics, an endeavour headed up by the vampire Lady Margolotta who takes her seat just outside the city of Bionk, and as such, since that city is also in place over the seat of the Dwarven Low King, the underground city of Schmalzberg, the underground city of Schmalzberg, this turns Bionk into the de facto capital of all Uberwald. Moving on through Uberwald and past it, and following the Vukes River, we come to the city of Genua, the only major city in this area, and a major trading hub for the region, as well as the sea it lays next to. This is probably among the areas of the disc that we know the least about, save for the city of Genua itself. The nearby nation of Brindisi has had only a handful of representative characters, and is somewhere that Pratis has never taken us directly, while the nation of Kithia appears only as a name on maps with no other apparent information about it. But heading a different direction away from the round tops, towards the Circle Sea and everyone's favourite region of the map, the Stowe Plains and its cities of Querm, Stolat, Stokerik, Stohelit, Pseudopolis, and of course the twin city of Ang. Ankh-Morpork. Ankh-Morpork is the biggest city on the disc, the most progressive, to use the word in its literal sense, and the centre of point for most of the Discworld stories that we've seen. It has existed for many thousands of years and has always played a major role in the politics of the Circle Sea region. In the past, through military and imperial power, and now in more modern times by being the cultural melting pot of the world, the seat of its technological advancement, and most importantly, the seat of economic power. Most people visiting Ankh will be amazed that the city manages to function as well as it does, especially given that the river that flows through it is infamous for only actually being a river in the technicality of geographic definitions, being full of silt, runoff from the Stowe Plain, city muck, and god knows what else, such that it is not only possible to run on the surface of the river, but in a good summer heat, plant life to the extent of small gorse bushes can sprout and thrive on the surface. But moving on from Ankh-Morpork before it takes up the whole video, as it has a tendency to do, we can now head over the Circle Sea to the continent of Clatch, away from the more European influence areas that we can see in the Stowe Plains, we now enter a land of deserts, sand dunes, river valleys, and dry mountain ranges. The biggest nation here is the Seraphate of Clatch, named for the continent, making its capital in the city of Al-Khali. Clatch occupies most of the good land on the turnwise coast of the continent, and is mostly renowned for its exports in coffee, and the kind of people who set about establishing curry houses and take away restaurants in the Stowe Plains cities. Staying around the Circle Sea for now, we also have the nations of Ephib, Sort and Jelly Baby, who are a 
anachronistic to the rest of the world, but no one seems to mind much or consider it odd, possibly down to the effects of narrativium or the history monks we mentioned before, doing their work as best they can. Down past Clatch on the Turnwise Peninsula, one finds the rainforests and open plains of Hawonderland. The only other places of note in this general area are the Great Neff Desert, the largest one on the disc, and were we to head across the Rim Ocean, we would find the Kingdom of Kroll. Kroll is a rather spiteful, isolationist nation that has nevertheless constructed one of the most impressive engineering feats ever conceived, the Circumfence. Water that runs off the edge of the disc in this stretch of the world, the Rimfall, is filtered by a large, heavy and sturdy net, such that anything that falls into it, including fish, boats, whales, pieces of boats, pieces of whales, and various other detritus of the sea are all gathered up and shipped back to the main island of Kroll. This mostly seafood diet is the reason speculated for the natives' general bad temper towards outsiders, although in more recent times they have traded slavery of those caught on the fence for considerably over-the-top salvage rates. But then I suppose when your customers are, as it were, a captive audience, you can certainly charge pretty much whatever you like. So, having gone down into both sides of the central ram tops, we have only one way left to go. In the opposite direction to the Circle C, we find the two most curious continents on the disc. Firstly, we have the Counterweight Continent. This name is not lightly given as it contains more golds and heavy metals to make up so much of its rock structure that it is considered the balance to the rest of the disc's landmass and is the home to the Agatean Empire, largely considered a contender for most powerful nation in the world, if not actually the winner of that title. Its land are hemmed in by a great wall extending out to a number of islands nearby including Bang Bang Duk and the Bitropi Islands. Xenophobic would be a useful if inaccurate word for them as the prevailing wisdom in the Empire is that the outside world doesn't even exist, and that the rest of the disc is a barren, haunted wasteland. Most of this is propaganda that, along with the wall, serves to keep the people inside accepting the caste system which is in place, which is so outmoded and strict that death penalties are doled out with depressing levels of casualness, and that there are people who are quite content to spend their entire lives going out into a field every day and holding a piece of rope tied to a single cow to make sure that said cow doesn't wander off. Although recent political upheavals brought about in the novels might be changing this attitude, we have yet to see if any of it's actually going ahead in any kind of detail. But for the sake of the people holding cows, we can certainly hope so. Lastly, we bring ourselves, fittingly enough, to the last continent, XXXX, or rather 4X. 4X is not Australia. It is merely an arid land filled with kangaroos, colourful birds, dropping bears, sheep, cities on the coastlines with good wine, good beer, a love of opera and a tribal culture who excel in forage and oak painting. Not even remotely Australia, so there is no significance to the fact that it was added to the disc after the rest of it was finished by a creator who specialises in following behind other creators and adding one last continent to their work, usually adding his personal favourite of animals, the kangaroo. And with this we come to the end of our brief rundown of the people, geography, physics and nations to be found on Terry Pratchett's disc world. I appreciate that I've had to be very vague in some places, so if there is any point that you have seen me cover in this first video that you would like me to prioritise on in future expansions in videos of their own, leave a comment below, like and subscribe if you just want to generally see more. But for now, I have been Albion, and I bid you farewell. Until next time.